Well, welcome all you wiretappers back here in the studio of Gangland Wire. Uh, we're going to go to St. Louis this week. I have a three-part, maybe four-part, I don't know. This is a pretty extensive uh, uh, crime families in St. Louis with some real unusual twists with Syrians and uh, Irishmen and Italians. And, and so it's, uh, it's, it's a real interesting combo mix, if you will, of gangs in St. Louis that morphed into the modern day Italian mafia and the Syrian mafia. I think we used to call it at one point in time, but I have Daniel Wall here, who is an author from St. Louis and he has written several books on it. Welcome, Daniel. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Gary. So Daniel, uh, tell us about, name off your books, guys, and I'll have pictures. You'll see pictures if you're on YouTube, and I'll have links to Daniel's YouTube page, but uh, name off your books. Uh, my first book is Egan's Rats, about the first and uh, most famous of the old St. Louis gangs. Uh, my second book is called Gangs of St. Louis, Men of Respect which covers not only Egan's Rats, but the Hogan Gang, uh, the Green Ones, the Pillow Gang, the Russo Gang, and of course, the Cuckoo Gang. Uh, I have a third book uh, about the Detroit-based Purple Gang called Off Color. Uh, I have a fourth book called Vanita, which is about the early years of the Detroit Mafia. And uh, my most recent book, Bathiok, uh, is a biography of Chicago gangster Frank McGurlin, who is a uh, cold-blooded psychopath who was known as the first gangster to use a Thompson submachine gun in Chicago. Wow, that will uh, take a whole episode itself. I may have to have you come back just to go down that path. That's really interesting. I got a lot of Chicago fans, too. You, you did some stuff with Detroit and with uh, St. Louis. I, I know I've always get asked about, well, what's the connection between the Detroit, I mean, the Kansas City Mafia and the St. Louis Mafia? You're so close. And I said, you know, I heard one of our guys married a girl who was of Syrian uh, ancestry, but I don't really know any connections. We, we never really got any much information. There's a little bit. We had one little thing uh, that'll happen in the 70s where uh, John Spica from St. Louis supposedly got some dynamite from one of our upstart young gangsters, Carl Spiro, and Nick Savella was mad at him, and, and he called Tony G or Tony G or Darno. But other than that, as far as business and all that, our guys are connected to Chicago. Your guys in Detroit were connected, I mean, in St. Louis, were connected to Detroit. Now, tell us a little bit about the history of that. Why are they so close to Detroit? Uh, it is a fraternal connection between the gangsters, the uh, mafiosos in uh, Detroit and St. Louis. Uh, many of their families come from the same Sicilian towns, specifically the towns of uh, Terracini and Chinesi and Partnico. Uh, they're small towns that are located west of Palermo. Uh, a lot of times families like the Bomberitos, Licavolis, Macheris, they all came from the same Sicilian towns. And as a result, they... Uh, when they, if their families immigrated to America, they tended to go where other people from the same village lived, which were mostly in the cities of St. Louis and Detroit. And as a result, as they entered lives of crime, they had uh, very strong connections between their Sicilian uh, Campari in their neighboring cities of whether it was St. Louis or Detroit. That like explains that for me. I really appreciate you explaining that for me. Let's start off with some of these early gangs. The, of course, back in the olden days, everybody was brand new, brand new immigrants. The Irish had been here before the Italians more than likely. So they probably were maybe the first gangs when the Italians first got there in St. Louis. So, so with those real early days, you know, they had the gangs of New York. They did a whole movie about it in Five Points area. Now, how did this go down in St. Louis? Uh, the vast majority of uh, early St. Louis gangs were political in nature. Uh, Egan's Rats, they initially got started as a uh, riverfront gang uh, that went through a couple of different phases, but they were originally known as the Ashley Street Gang. Uh, they lived in the eastern edge of uh, St. Louis's Irish district, which was known as the Cary Patch. They specifically lived in an area of the Cary Patch called Pigeon Hill, which bordered right on the Mississippi River. Uh, it was about where uh, the Lumiere Casino is now. And they got their start uh, picking pockets, robbing people, uh, doing burglaries. But the early Egan's Rats, they functioned as political terrorists. Because the city of St. Louis had numerous elect, they had elections of every, just about every year. 
for different parts of the city government. And what the Egan rats would do is that they would go to the polls, they would vote illegally, repeat vote, they would prevent their opponents from voting, terrorizing voters, stuffing ballot boxes, the whole nine yards. A lot of that has to do with how fragmented St. Louis city government was in the late 19th century uh, that would enable uh, the Egan's rats and other gangs to be able to put their favorite politicians in office. And once the politicians got into office, they used the gangsters to enforce their will. And those political positions were very lucrative for the men who had them. Uh, probably the best known of the early gangsters was a guy named Thomas Kenny. His nickname was Snake Kenny. And he was basically the first boss, if you will, of the Egan's Rats. Now, Egan's Rats, that most famously, I think, in more modern times was Fred Killer Burke and maybe somebody else that that went up and worked for Al Capone and became known as his American boys. Now, can you tell us a little bit about Fred Killer Burke and, and that relationship? Sure. Uh, Fred, Bur Fred Killer Burke's original name was uh, Thomas Camp. He was actually born in uh, southeastern Kansas on a farm. Uh, he went to Sunday school. He even briefly studied veterinary medicine before he turned to crime. In fact, his gangland buddies actually nicknamed him Doc rather than Killer Burke. Um, he eventually went to Kansas City and started doing some small time crimes and migrated west to uh, St. Louis. Uh, he got indicted for forgery at one point. Uh, he joined the army and fought in France in World War I. He was a tank corps sergeant. Uh, he did prison time in both Michigan uh, and in Missouri at Jeff City. Uh, in the early 20s, uh, Egan's rats had morphed from political terrorists into bootleggers slash high profile thieves. They specialized in robbing banks, uh, bank messengers, uh, and Fred Burke uh, came to Egan's Rats and uh, had an idea for a job. And him and some of the boys uh, held up the United Railways Company office in St. Louis at 39th and Park on July 3rd, 1923. That was a streetcar company provider for the city. And uh, they ended up uh, getting about $39,000 in cash. Uh, while they were driving away and escaping through South City, St. Louis, uh, one of the tires on their getaway car popped off and they ended up having to carjack another motorist so they could successfully escape. Uh, after the bulk of uh, the Egan gang leadership went to prison for mail robbery in November of 1924, Fred Burke and a number of his buddies eventually fell into the lower ranks of the Cuckoo Gang for a time. And then they moved on around the country and started doing all various kinds of mayhem. Uh, they attached themselves to the Purple Gang for a time. Uh, Fred Burke became an expert shot with the Thompson submachine gun, and he used that uh, Tommy gun very effectively for the Purple Gang, killing three of their enemies in what's known as uh, the Miraflores Massacre in March of 1927. Uh, Burke and his buddies eventually fell out with the Purple Gang, and they headed west and fell in with the Capone mob. Uh, Al Capone apparently had a soft spot for... Uh, the, the ex Egan's Rats boys, uh, in particular Gus Winkler, who was a close buddy of uh, Fred Burke. He nicknamed them their American boys because they weren't Italian. And he ended up using them at, for uh, special high risk assignments. Uh, one job, they went into uh, Brooklyn, New York in July of 1928 and killed uh, Capone's old mentor, Frankie Yale, in an incident that got national headlines. And then Al decided that the American boys would be perfect to take out Bugs Moran in Chicago. And these St. Louis American boys working with a Capone affiliated crew on the north side of Chicago called the Circus Cafe Gang were the ones who pulled off the St. Valentine's Day Massacre in 1929. The Circus Cafe Gang, that was what Tony Accardo was involved in early on in his career. So that's uh, that's really yes. interesting there. Uh, maybe Tony Accardo was probably at the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. That's a that's an interesting uh, area to to look into. But anyhow, I, I know I read about Fred Burke that they 
found him later on. Uh, they did a search warrant or something, or they searched the house and they recovered a Thompson submachine gun and, and ballistically it connected back to the St. Valentine's Day massacre. So that's not just, you know, some informant saying that or some policeman right. speculating. That's you know, that's backed up by solid evidence, isn't it? Oh yeah. That, not only did they match the machine guns, Burke also had the very some very distinctive 45 caliber ammunition that was fired in the garage. It was a special run of bullets out of the Denver factory that were stamped with like a small S that only like a handful of them were ever made. So that's another solid uh, uh, evidence link between wow. Burke and his wow. guns in the massacre. The Pilla gang, that was the Italian gang in St. Louis, right? So tell us a little bit about how that came together. The Pillow gang uh, was originally uh, a group of Sicilian mafiosi uh, that originally got through st start as black hand artists. They were originally led by a, a gentleman by the name of Pasquale Santino. He and many of the men in his crew were from Southern Sicily, specifically the area around uh, Agrigento province. Uh, and uh, they continued, they locked heads with uh, the other Sicilian factions of the mafia family, notably the green ones and the uh, Russo boys. Uh, during the 1927 Civil War, where the Mafia factions were all shooting each other to pieces, uh, Santino was killed and they were taken over by his second in command, uh, Charlie Fursina. Charlie Fursina was from northeastern Sicily. And during the war, he and his bodyguards were ambushed in uh, the Dogtown section of St. Louis. And Charlie, the bodyguards were killed and Charlie Fursina took a machine gun bullet through his lower hip. And while he was recovering from it, he used a, a pillow to cushion his rear end when he sat down in chairs. And police saw him doing this, and they sarcastically nicknamed his crew the Pillow Gang. And that's where that came from. The Sicilians are coming together. There's several Sicilian-based gangs during up leading up to Prohibition. And then something's going to happen, just like all over the United States, the old black handers and, and the old, you know, street thugs and people preying on other Italian members of the community are going to be pushed out. You know, it's depicted in the Godfather movie that mm -hmm. these guys, these young guys come up and start with Lucky Luciano and they start pushing out these old guys and they're going to get into bootlegging because that's where the money is. So can you talk about that transition in, in St. Louis? Uh, with the uh, the Sicilian Mafia, they started off uh, cooking uh, homemade whiskey because of the location of St. Louis, uh, because it's pretty much in the center of the country. It's relatively far away from the borders of Canada or Mexico. And shipping whiskey, especially in the early years of Prohibition, was difficult for the St. Louis Mafia. And they were still considered relatively small potatoes. So they started, what they did was they erected uh, illegal stills, not only in and around the city of St. Louis, but across the river in Illinois. And that's where a large supply of their illegal whiskey came from. And uh, they, they also did a, a similar operation with beer as well. Uh, eventually, they got to make so much money that eventually greed took over. And that's how they started fighting with each other. But in 1926, a war started between the Sicilian gangs and the Cuckoo Gang, which was based in South City at the time. And uh, quite frankly, the Cuckoo Gang wiped the floor with them. They inflicted a lot of casualties on the mafia to the point where other mob bosses from the East Coast actually had to come into St. Louis and mediate it. And the Cuckoo Gang demanded uh, extensive reparations for starting the war. And uh, they were, the terms were quite humiliating. I mean, the mafia had to go buy each cuckoo gangster a new suit of clothes and a new car and uh, give them like $50,000 cash or something like that. It was a real black eye for the St. Louis mob hierarchy. And I, my own personal opinion is that their reputation with other mafia families around the country never fully recovered from that. Maybe with yes, the help of the other people, and, and especially out of Detroit, because you had a pretty strong Sicilian faction going during Prohibition in Detroit. Uh, the Licavolis had some connection back down to uh, uh, St. Louis, and then one of the Licavolis went to Cleveland. Talk about that, kind of how that, during Prohibition, and how how's this all going to shake out? Uh, a number of members, after the Russo brothers, two of them were killed, and the rep fled the city in the summer of 1928. The Russos initially went down to uh, Fort Worth, Texas before migrating to Cleveland, 
what was left of their faction, quite a few of their number uh, moved to Detroit, specifically uh, the Licaboli brothers and the Macheris, and they joined a, the pre-existent family in Detroit. And uh, eventually, uh, Thomas Licavoli, who's also known as Yanni because his original name was Damiano, he started up a crew in Toledo, Ohio, which uh, grew very powerful until uh, Licavoli himself was in prison for murder in 1934, I believe it was. He killed, he got into a, a beef with a gangster named uh, Jack Kennedy, of all things. <laughs> this, this Jack Kennedy was actually having an affair with Licavoli's wife. And I think uh, another one of the lick of all these dop guys confronted him about it. And Kennedy apparently uh, beat the heck out of him. And uh, after Kennedy was killed, lick of Foley and a couple other people were convicted of his murder and sentenced to life in uh, the Ohio State Prison. But uh, lick of Foley's cousin, Jack lick of Foley, eventually moved to Cleveland and in the 1970s became the boss of that family. And in the 1970s, Jack Licavoli became involved in a very high profile war with a gangster named Danny Green. Yeah. <laughs> As made famous in the movie Kill the Irishman. So uh, yes. <laughs> but I, I, I thank you. I, I did want to tie that together because I knew there was a connection from mm -hmm. St. Louis to Ohio and, and Detroit and Cleveland. So I'm, I appreciate you tying that all together. <laughs> And the other Licavoli will, and he had another Licavoli that stays in Detroit that that becomes a mover and shaker later on in Detroit, correct? Yes, there's that's uh, Pete. Pete stayed in Detroit for a number of years, and then he eventually moved to Arizona. Okay. And uh, I think, I believe that he had shares of the Aladdin Casino, if I'm not mistaken. And he became very big in like Tucson, Arizona and whatnot. And uh, he eventually, I think he had, a, a, if I remember correctly, he had a very large uh, ranch down there. So he did very, out of all the Licavoli brothers, he was probably the one who did the best overall, Pete. Uh, so now where does Tony Giordano, Tony G, come in this? He, does he start coming up during these, the, the uh, prohibition, but post-prohibition and uh, the depression era? Is that when Tony Giordano starts coming up? I get the impression that Tony Giordano uh, made his bones either, uh, just after prohibition ended. I remember him being connected to a gangland homicide in, I believe it was the spring of 1934. A gentleman by the name of Mike Palazzolo was killed, and uh, Tony Giordano was a suspect. Uh, I remember seeing something about Tony Giordano in the uh, early 40s. I'm not quite as versed on mob history like after World War II. Yeah, I got but, you. Uh, but yeah, this post-prohibition, that's when Tony Giordano starts coming into the picture. So... Uh... So now my next question is, see, St. Louis is so diverse and so interesting is the Syrian families and, mm -hmm. and where did they come from and how did they fit into this early on? Uh, the Syrian uh, crime families, they grew up in Soulard, uh, just south of downtown, uh, notably Jimmy Michaels and uh, a couple of, I think he had a couple of younger brothers as well. But Jimmy Michaels grew up with the Tipton brothers who lived in uh, Soulard. Uh, they were a street gang that hung out together. Incidentally, the, the Tiptons, uh, Jimmy Michaels, and a couple of their buddies, they were originally Sandlot baseball players. Hmm. And uh, they got the name Cuckoo from a brand of soda pop that sponsored their baseball team <laughs> in the early teens. Oh, I have I have looked high and low for like an advertisement or something for this cuckoo soda pop, but I've yeah. never been able to find it. If anyone out there has it, yeah, please let me know. <laughs> but uh, they eventually uh, started getting into trouble in the late teens, and uh, the police kind of tacked the name Cuckoo Gang on them, and they partnered up with some older crooks who were part of a pre-existent crew of thieves known as the, the Shoto Avenue Gang, who kind of showed them the ropes of the underworld. And before long, the younger Cuckoo Gang eventually knocked off the older boss of the Shoto Avenue Gang. I believe his name was Jack Lyons. And they started bootlegging in and around uh, Soulard and other points in South St. Louis. And Jimmy Michaels and the rest of the Syrians uh, were dragged into a gang war with the Sicilians because some of the younger members of the Green Ones tried to frame Jimmy Michaels for a murder. But unbeknownst to them, not only did Jimmy Michaels beat the rap, he came back after them and just just unleashed hell on them. Uh, 
by his 22nd birthday, Jimmy Michaels was already a prime suspect in eight unsolved gangland homicides. Wow. So wow. it's literally through the sheer force of criminal willpower that Jimmy Michaels catapulted himself into a leadership position in the Cuckoo Gang. And all of his Syrian buddies, uh, Pete Webby was one, Gus Webby, uh, they all came along for the ride. Eventually, after Prohibition, uh, Jimmy Michaels ended up doing a number of years in prison. He got out in 1944, I believe it was. Jimmy Michaels commanded an enormous amount of respect from the Sicilian mob hierarchy just because of who he was and what he had done. So as a result, Michaels and his family existed. They had a somewhat autonomous relationship with the, Sicil the traditional Sicilian mafia in St. Louis. And... Going into the 40s and 50s, another family appears, which would be the Leisures. And uh, eventually they uh, ran afoul of Jimmy Michaels. I believe uh, one of the Leisures, Richard Michaels, Richard Leisure, was uh, killed in a bar brawl, I believe it was, in East St. Louis. And the Leisures became convinced that Jimmy Michaels helped his killer get off. And so that yeah. started an, a, a lot of animosity towards them. And that culminated in their, their war around 1980 or 81 or what. Right. Uh, the Leisures and Michaels, though, these two Syrian families, when they were fighting in the early 80s, they were indeed the last vestiges of an organization that, once upon a time, had been known as the Cuckoo Gang. Oh, interesting. Even though they stopped using the name Cuckoo Gang around World War II or so. Yeah. So... Um... During the 30s, during the Depression, and Prohibition's over, did, how did they move into gambling? Were they part of the National Wire Service? And they had a, there was a Sportsman's Park, I think. There was a racetrack in, in St. Louis. Was there was that a big moneymaker for the, the mob during that time? Yes. Yes, it was. Uh, most of the gambling, it seems to me, like especially uh, post-World War II, uh, was kind of remote controlled by the Chicago. Chicago outfit. They, uh, the, the the St. Louis mob kind of managed it for Chicago. Uh, Chicago spoke spoke for St. Louis, you know, in meetings with the commission, that kind of stuff. But absolutely, uh, the racetracks, illegal uh, gambling parlors, you know, that kind of stuff. It was a very big money maker for the mob. So, so what about their uh, involvement in union racketeering? Now, did that start then or did that start later on because by the time of this leisure war and uh in the 70s and 80s that's a huge money maker for them as the uh, laborers union so yes did that start back then uh yeah the union racketeering dates back to uh the last days of prohibition when you know the the, the illegal alcohol business was you know with, with repeal i mean they're going to lose that money maker so they have to look at other ways to make money and that was when they started getting involved with union racketeering and whatnot. And uh, yeah, the, I, I believe it was local 110 of the labor union. That was a focal point of uh, the legal, the leisure wars in the, the early 80s were those union positions. Yeah, was there anything, what about the Italians in, in labor unions during the 30s? Or did they just stick to, you know, handling swag and, and things like that? I'm, I'm sure that I'm sure that they did. I mean, yeah, the Italians certainly wouldn't want, wouldn't want to pass up uh the, the money and the profits that uh, the illegal union racketeering had to offer. That's really interesting about the Chicago connection. I didn't know that before either, that, that Chicago. Mm -hmm. I do know that that when uh, Giordano's nephew was getting ready to take over, the story goes that he went to Iupa in Chicago and got his approval and then yes. came, came back and supposedly it got out to the newspapers that he'd done that in Iupa uh, accused Trupiano of leaking that to the newspapers. I don't know if there's any truth to that story or not, but but that Chicago influence over him is, is really interesting. I tell you, that Chicago, they controlled the Midwest. Uh, you would have thought he would have had to go to Detroit maybe, but but they had to go to Chicago for that kind of approval for the next boss. Yeah, even, even as far back as the 30s, uh, Frank Agrusa, whose real name was Frank Abate, he was the protege of uh, Vito Gianola, the former boss of the fam of the Green Ones that was killed during Prohibition. Uh, Abate slash Agrusa ran the St. Louis family in the late 20s, early 30s. He was the official boss, but he was little more than a puppet of the Capone mob in Chicago. In fact, when he was deposed in St. Louis, he eventually moved up to the Chicago area and was like demoted to a captain. 
And eventually, uh, he, he ran afoul of the, the Chicago mob. He tried to ha- hide in rural Arkansas, and they found him down there and took care of him there oh, really? in uh, 1944, I believe it was. Oh, yeah. I hadn't heard that story. You know, speaking of that time, you may not know anything about this. There was a famous kidnapping in Kansas City of the um, Greenlease baby or boy. Yes, you know, I have heard of it. And mm-hmm. the people that did it, they got like five hundred thousand dollars, and they went to St. Louis and started drinking and spending this guy's money, and a corrupt Chicago uh, St. New uh, St. Louis police and a corrupt St. Louis policeman ended up arresting him and bringing that money in. And that was connected through, they were staying in a hotel that was a mob connected hotel. And the cab driver that was hauling him around was, you remember anything about that story? You think yeah, that- I remember, I remember hearing about it, but I have never uh, researched the green lace case okay. in depth, but yeah, I absolutely have heard of it though. It, it looked but- like probably the, the mob boss at the time who had been Giordano, I guess, or whoever was just before him ended up with a big bulk of that, like there was 300,000, I think, missing out of the 500,000 in the end or some number like that. And it never reappeared any, and they had all the serial numbers written down and and some bills reappeared in Chicago. You mentioned Chicago. There's a few bills that did reappear in Chicago, but other than that, that whole $300,000 during uh, 1950, 50 is when it was, that's a lot of money, $500,000 in 1950. So, uh, so interesting. I, that was, uh, I, I assume that the St. Louis police department was probably uh, corrupted totally by the mafia during these years was there any was there any uh crime busters or anything that that kind of that that did anything about the mob uh during prohibition there actually was a pretty tough squad led by a uh, captain by the name of john carroll and he was notoriously pitiless with crooks couldn't be bought the whole nine yards yeah. in fact he even killed a couple members of the russo gang in a police chase in uh, october of 1926 uh he uh Excuse me. Uh, some members of the St. Louis Police Department, their squad, they outfitted themselves with an armored car and Thompson submachine guns <laughs> as early as 1921. Hmm. So St. Louis is one of the few cities in America where the cops actually got their hands on the Tommy gun before the gangsters did. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wonder how that came about. They must have had some military connections back then. and. <laughs> Mm-hmm. They would have snagged them out of an armory or something. <laughs> it was straight. Yeah, the Thompson submachine gun, it was really slow to take off sales wise. It was yeah. first marketed commercially in March of 1921, but because it wasn't used in World War I, it didn't really have much of a reputation. And it was pretty expensive. It cost $200 retail, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which was about half the, co- half the price of a car back then. So just, you know, the average Joe couldn't really afford it. The post, the post service, the postal service bought some to protect their messengers and departments like the St. Louis Police Department, they could obviously afford it. In fact, I think just a few years back, uh, the St. Louis Police Department actually discovered some of these machine guns that they had like in cold storage or whatever, and they auctioned a whole bunch of them off. Huh, yeah, if only I had like about seventy thousand dollars laying around, I would have bought one. <laughs> that that would be a collector's item, a uh, mm-hmm. Thompson submachine gun that had been around since the twenties. That you knew mm-hmm. had been around since the twenties. You could document that. That would be quite a collector's item. There. It's is, that, is there anything else you need to tell us about? Uh, this, sure. Uh, sure. When we were talking about the Greenlees kidnapping. Uh, are you familiar with a, a gangster by the name of Jack Griffin? I don't think so, no. Uh, he was uh, an Irish gangster who was actually a member of the Russo gang in St. Louis during Prohibition. He was kind of an anomaly as an Irish gangster moving within a Sicilian crime family. He actually had a working knowledge of the Italian language, uh, and he was a cold-blooded killer. He was believed to have been the one who killed Vito Gianola, the boss of the, fa- of the mafia family, in the attic of his girlfriend's house. Uh, as a result, the Green Ones tried to kill him multiple times. He survived a, a number of violent attempts on his life, and he eventually, in 1933, moved to Kansas City. He adopted the name Jack Gregory and uh, tried to work his way into the crime scene there. But, you know, uh, Johnny Lazier ran the Kansas City mob like a closed shop. Yeah. And Jack Griffin and a crew of gangsters he worked with 
eventually were accused of assassinating Johnny Lazzi on Kansas City in July of 1934. And the Kansas City mob uh, tried to kill Griffin. They wounded him and they put him in the hospital. And uh, at one point, the uh, FBI came to interview him about not only uh, the Lazia murder, but also about the Kansas City massacre, which had happened a year earlier. And it turned out that a corrupt Kansas City cop by the name of uh, Detective Lieutenant Jeff Rayan took Griffin out of the hospital in an ambulance and basically killed him. Uh, one story goes is while he was being driven uh, to his doom down Independence Boulevard or whatever, uh, he asked the goons on either side of him in the car for one last cigarette. They're like, okay, sure, why not? So Griffin lights up the cigarette, puffs it to a red hot glow, and jams it into the eye of the guy sitting next to him. <laughs> and in a rage, they end up like burning him alive in the furnace of an apartment building. Huh, interesting. But uh, gr uh, all of Griffin's guys, most of them at the hands of Jeff Ray and himself, ended up getting killed. Uh, one of them, uh, Jimmy Needles LaCapra, ended up falling into the hands of the FBI. They protected him for a little while, but kicked him loose and he was eventually tracked down and killed in uh, uh, upstate New York, I believe it was. The only guy involved in Lazia's murder who got away was a gentleman by the name of L Nugent La Palma. He hid out in Colorado for a while. The Kansas City mob sent some guys after him in Colorado and La Palma actually killed one of them outside of Pueblo mm -hmm. and got away. He turned up in the late 1950s as a union official in Seattle. But by that point, uh, I guess enough time had gone by that uh, the Kansas City mob just decided to let bygones be bygones as far as Johnny Lazzi was concerned. And yeah, Nugent La Palma lived to be like 83 years old and died in uh, August of 90, 1996. Hmm. But yeah, uh, <laughs> that specific St. Louis gangster, Jack Griffin, definitely made his mark in the Kansas City underworld. I'll have to look that up. I didn't really know that story before. It's a, it's a really interesting story. I I, I end up focusing on things all around the United States and don't really do that much city <laughs> stuff, actually. I'd be quite honest. Uh, only if I, I was involved, then I'll, I've done that. But, mm -hmm, uh, sure. but the old stuff, I am, I've i done a little bit, but not a lot. So this is this has been great, uh, uh, Daniel. I really appreciate you helping us fill in our knowledge base on St. Louis mob and how important they were, you know, in the Midwest with the other cities. Now they're related to these other cities. Uh, I guess one last question. What about that, that lawyer, Morris Schenker? Uh, do, you, do you know, remember anything about him? I've heard the name, but to be honest, okay. I don't know a whole heck of a lot about it. No, I'm sorry. No problem. He, he was, he was Jimmy Hoffa's lawyer for a while, real tight with Jimmy Hoffa and he got mm -hmm. involved with Las Vegas things and, and he was a, a really famous threat by Joy Lombardo out of Chicago. He told him, he said, you say you're 73 or your, your birthday, you're going to be 73. And you're 72 now. Well, if you want to see 73, you'll you'll pay this money to <laughs> Alan Dorfman. So, <laughs> and another funny story about him. And I know as a St. Louis guy, his story, and you'll appreciate this. I have a friend here on the police department. Actually, we went to Academy together. And he's from St. Louis. His name's Jim Fitzgerald. And he always told a story about his dad. It was an Irishman, of course, and had a gas station and was kind of a mover and shaker in a, some kind of a you know neighborhood around there in, in uh, wherever that gas station was. I think it was somewhere around uh, Forest Park. And he ran for city council and his opponent was Morris Schenker <laughs> and he got beat. <laughs> and he, he said his dad used to say, well, that's pretty good. I got beat by a Jew in an Irish ward. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so St. Louis has really uh, more than Kansas city maintained their different ethnic kind of neighborhoods and, and relationships. It seems to me like Kansas city, yes. people didn't really retain it that much. They moved out the suburbs pretty quick and, and kind of blended in. But St. Louis is just like back East or Chicago. They maintain those ethnic neighborhoods. Yes, there's uh, there's Dogtown and the Hill, of course. They yeah. there's recently made a real nice documentary about the Hill. Which yeah, be, uh, I heard that. And, check out. And if any of you guys out there, you ever want some really good Italian food, he just mentioned the Hill. Well, that's the Italian section, and that's where all the good Italian food is. There's a ton of good Italian restaurants there. What's your favorite there on the Hill? Uh, G and Tony's. G and Tony's. Yeah, I think that's yep. the one I've been to. I think that's the most famous one. The one everybody <laughs> seems to recommend. So G and Tony's, guys, if you ever go down there. So Daniel Wall, I really appreciate you doing that. Have you got any new books that you're working on? What are you working on now? 
Uh, actually, Gary, yes, I'm working on a reboot of Egan's Rats, my original book. I'm working on an updated and expanded history of Egan's Rats, the gang. Uh, its tentative title is The Apaches of St. Louis, an updated and expanded history of Egan's Rats. Hmm. Uh, it delves a lot more deeply into their, their story, specifically the political aspect of it, and uh, a lot more ex expanded history of both the gangsters themselves, their family histories, their crimes, and also correcting you know some errors that were in my first book. Yeah. Uh, Self-publishing it, so I'll be able to make it as long as I want to. It's it, it's strictly for the fans and the diehard uh, you know, <laughs> readers, that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. But uh, it's, I'm working on it. It's a ways from completion, though. Probably won't be done until maybe 2025 or so, but okay. it is on the way. Well, that's what we've got here is diehard fans. I promise you that. <laughs> and, and, and no frills, uh, mafia history here on uh, Gangland Wire. I get people make comments on Facebook every once in a while about that. We like you because you just deal with the history and then none of the drama and the. <laughs> Some of these other guys, they want to, these mobsters have gone into business, so to speak, and then they act like they've got a fight between each other. So uh, oh, no. <laughs> this is no frills, just solid mob history. So Daniel, well, I really appreciate you coming on the show. And Thanks for having sharing your knowledge with us and guys don't forget i'll i'll have links to all his books his author's page if you will on the on amazon so if you want one of these books why why you can really get a sense of the midwest mafia and its relationships and how they connected back in the early days we kind of tend to to go after the more modern kind of action and oriented things but where did everybody come from and and how did they develop here in the midwest there, there's a lot of stuff about new york and how that developed there in the five families but not that much about the midwest so this is a big piece of it st louis was right in the middle detroit cleveland chicago and and had some connection to kansas city but kansas city seemed to develop on its own it's i don't know it's, it's a little it, it's hard to understand sometimes how this worked but you explained a lot of it how people came from the same town in sicily and that then came out from there. So, Daniel, I really appreciate you coming on the show. And guys, don't forget, I like to ride motorcycles. So if you're out there driving around, watch out for motorcycles. If you have a problem with PTSD, as you know, I always say, go to their website, the VA website, if you've been in the service, and get that hotline number. If you've got a problem with drugs or alcohol, you can get help from a real deal former Gambino soldier, Anthony Ruggiano. Go to his website or his YouTube page. That's Anthony Ruggiano. Like and subscribe and keep coming back. I really appreciate everybody that listens in and be sure and check out Daniel Waugh's author page down in the show notes. Thanks, guys.